I don't think a lot of people going into um, undergrad really know a ton about material science before you go in, so it's kind of something you have to find a little bit. So actually when I went back to school, I actually went for engineering, but went into civil, and then I had, I had to take a materials class, and it was basically a professor who taught a really good intro to materials class that I was like, well, this is great. While I was an undergrad, I got a co-op at a consulting company um, in Detroit, and so basically doing sort of failure analysis, um, looking at microstructures at different parts and things like that. And um, my boss there said, you need to go to grad school. And I said, I thought I just finished school, um, but said, well, you really should go to grad school. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, well, if, if you go anywhere, go out to Colorado, go to Golden, Colorado, and go see the school in Colorado. And so I visited, saw the mountains, you know, coming from the Midwest, that was kind of cool for me. Um, I really wanted to go there, and then so I talked to the professors there, and it sort of fit pretty well. Um, so I got a master's degree in metallurgical materials engineering, um, then went and got a job doing consulting, which was pretty similar to what I was doing as, as a co-op. Um, so that, was, that ended up being in Minnesota and St. Cloud. Um, so I really enjoyed that job. It was a really small company. You know, the first school I went to was a really big school. I kind of got lost. There was the owner, there was one engineer, and I was the second engineer. So it's like I could do, I was in control of a lot of stuff, right? So I had a lot of responsibility right away um, and um, a lot of sort of pathways to figure out how to, how to get, um, how to build the business and you really get tied in really quickly. And so I like that small community. Um, I spent two years there, um, and during that time, um, I, I got married, and so my wife Amy's actually sitting over here. So um, I got married, so she also, she was doing a PhD at Colorado School of Mines, so we met in Colorado, and then it took a couple years, but then we kind of ended up together, and so uh, I went back to get a PhD, right, didn't want to go to grad school, went and got a master's, went and got a job, and then went back. So went back and got a PhD. And then um, after the PhD, um, we went to industry for a little while. So and kind of decided that that wasn't really a thing that we liked. And then ended up going to Los Alamos National Lab for about 10 years or so, seven or eight years. Um, spent some time there doing a lot of metals deformation work. Um, and then um, we kind of got an opportunity to come back to Colorado School of Mines. There were two job openings that sort of happened pretty serendipitously. Um, and so um, that opportunity happened and it was kind of one of those things that it's like, if we don't do this, it's not gonna happen. Um, so we did that. And so we've, we've been at Colorado School of Mines as professors for four years now. So um, definitely not a pathway that I planned, um, but you kind of just take the opportunities that you that, that are in front of you, and usually things work out pretty well, I think. Sounds like it. So my name is Nolan Hoffman. I am currently a research mechanical engineer at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But starting back at the beginning, I went to, to school at the University of Alabama. I majored in mechanical engineering. I did several, well, I say several, I did a co-op with Honda while I was there, so I did three rotations. And then I also did a couple of different internships, Southern Company and then a smaller electronics company, Digital Answers. Uh, I got my, my current job straight out with my bachelor's degree. I uh, met my boss, which is still my current boss, at a career fair of all places. I guess that's what they're meant for. But not the typical, it doesn't seem like the typical path, but sometimes it works out that way. And so when I finished my undergraduate work, I was, I was tired. I was burnt out of school. I said, I'm not, I'm not doing the school thing anymore. I'm going to work. I'm going to spend some time doing work. Well, as soon as I got to, to Erdick in Vicksburg, the next semester I started grad school. So <laughs> it's funny how that works, right? I took one semester off, it was, it was a nice little break. And then I started taking uh, one class at a time, distance through Mississippi State. So I am still finishing up. It's been almost four years and this should be my last semester. So hopefully I'll be finished uh, in a couple of weeks. But. Uh, so while I've been there and at, at, at Erdix, I've been working on uh, some expeditionary airfields, extruded hollow core, uh, 
aluminum landing mats for, for air, aircraft when you want to build a, a runway or an airfield somewhere that you don't want to go in and permanently build a runway, pave a runway, you can put them in and take them out when you're done. And so that's been part of my research while, I'm, while I've been there and some other different testing and evaluation. But I guess starting out with my with my bachelor's when I first arrived at, at Erdic, uh, I did more testing and evaluation. And so as I've as I've been working through more graduate work, I've been transitioning more into a research-oriented role. With and we still have a lot of a lot of uh, applied research projects. So we do. I still do a lot of testing and evaluation, but it's been, I've been transitioning more into more of a, a little more of a basic research position. So that kind of takes us to where we are here. My story is a little shorter than some other people's. <laughs> You have to look at me. To say, I'm, on, I'm Mark Horstmeyer. I'm Dean of Engineering at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. And um, my story started at West Virginia University undergrad, an Ohio State master's degree, PhD at Georgia Tech. Then I worked 17 years, six, about 16 years at Sandia National Laboratories. And well, actually, it was one year of Owens Corning fiberglass in Ohio. And that was interesting. I only needed one year of industry. And then I went to the National Labs in Livermore, California, 16 years. And Remy will probably tell you it's a great job. It was a great job for me. And then I became a faculty member of Mississippi State for 16 years. And about a year ago, I took this job to be dean. And if I could, let me just ask for a raise of hands. Who's an undergraduate student out there? How many undergrads? OK, let me speak to you for a second. When you go through K through 12, you're taught to react. They're t they tell you that two plus two equals four, and then they test you and they say two plus two equals, and you say four. four. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but undergraduate education in engineering, in particular materials, there's too much work for you to do, and we do that on purpose. It's not like you're playing frisbee on the lawn like the psychology students, right? You're an engineer. <laughs> So there's too much to do. So your process changes to organization, analysis, and priorities. That's your process of change. Your thinking changes, okay, as your undergrad. The graduate program is completely orthogonal to that. It's synthesis. And the synthesis of complex, disparate information is what the PhD, master's and PhD is about. So all you undergrads, I encourage you strongly to go to grad school to get that extra level of thinking because that's what's valued, whether it's industry, academia, research institute, whatever. Everybody, I'm Melanie Ling. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Form Alloy. Uh, we design and manufacture directed energy deposition systems, which is a, basically a 3D metal printer. Um, I got my start uh, as an aerospace engineer. I went to University of Illinois for undergrad. Um, I did a co-op with Boeing in St. Louis, and then um, following my undergrad, I went to go work at Lockheed Martin uh, doing algorithm development for a, an air defense system. Um, I ended up going to grad school at uh, University of Southern California, um, and I started in uh, aerospace engineering and then transferred to systems engineering and architecture because I wanted to uh, sort of broaden the scope of the types of projects and things that I was working at in grad school. And then I spent another uh, 11 years at Lockheed for a total of 14 years. And then I left there to start Form Alloy, uh, which is in its fifth year now. And um, the reason why I did that is because I was, a, I was a hobbyist 3D printer, you know, going to maker fairs and that kind of thing about 10 years ago. And then in my real job, I, I kept on running into um, issues where something couldn't be made, or the sustainment tail was uh, too expensive, or uh, a training mission was paused uh, out on an aircraft carrier, you know, costing taxpayers millions of dollars because they were missing a part. And I kept on coming back to, but I can make anything at my house, I mean, out of plastic with this little silly polymer thing. And so um, I thought if I could do what I'm doing at home for junk, um, I could probably do the same thing for metals and actually make an impact on the industry and how high value components are manufactured. Um, and uh, now uh, Form Alloy is located uh, just outside of San Diego here and we're selling machines into aerospace manufacturers and research institutes and universities and kind of enabling the future of what uh, component 
uh, manufacturing looks like. And um, we can do really cool things like multi-material and functionally graded components and work with really unique alloys. Uh, we do a lot with copper alloys. We do uh, magnetic material. Really wide range of materials can be used uh, with our process. So. Um, you're looking for new employees here. and you have 50 yeah. openings right now. Actually, I see some people in the room that I've talked to about employment, so thank you for stopping by our booth. Um, we're, we're definitely hiring, so um, yeah. uh, Hi everyone, my name is uh, Remy. I'm a staff member at the uh, Sandia National Labs. Uh, so I got my undergrad and master's in France, and uh, during that process, uh, I met my future PhD advisor at Georgia Tech. And before joining Georgia Tech, actually, I worked for a year as a consulting engineer in the aerospace industry in Belgium. And one day he called me and uh, he was asking me if I would be interested in like, coming to Georgia Tech. I was like, well, I'm when? so in Belgium, they speak French and Flemish, and I was speaking French, uh, I was speaking English. And I hang out, my boss looked at me and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, you have no idea. Because <laughs> it was English. <laughs> Uh, so then I, I went to Georgia Tech, uh, where I got my PhD. Uh, after my PhD, I did a postdoc at the Sandia National Labs for uh, two years, and then I left. Uh, I became a professor at NYU for a couple of years, uh, and for different reasons. One, which was financial, raising kids in New York City was complicated, uh, and I missed also the, uh, the lab, uh, the national lab environments, which was very team-oriented and a lot of collaboration as opposed to academia where you're a little more on an island. Uh, you have to like basically fight for your turf a little bit more, it seems like, retrospectively. <laughs> um, and so I, I basically, after a few years at NYU, uh, I moved back to, uh, to San Diego where I'm involved like so many different interesting uh, projects and, and research directions. Uh, now I do a lot more fundamental research, but I was also exposed into uh, leading very large projects, engineering projects, uh, to support uh, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, for example. So helping the uh, NRC, uh, helping them develop uh, guidelines for licenses and stuff like that uh, for their uh, for their operations. Ask away. Go ahead. Stand up. Hi, my name is Zachary Tomlin with the University of, uh, of California, Sacramento. I have a question for you, Mark. Um, so you talk about the, the value of higher education and that kind of stuff. Would you recommend um, going to work first and having a company sponsor you through that process or doing that? Good question. I definitely have, would have somebody sponsor me. Uh, work at a company and have them sponsor you. Sandia had a program, a doctoral study program that, um, of course, in those days, I mean, I don't know if you know this, uh, you had to be female or minority. I was the first white Caucasian male to ever uh, make it through uh, but they paid for my PhD at Georgia Tech and, uh, but yeah the experience in in industry and in the labs uh, I think it's worth a lot than going into ac I say go to academia after yeah um, yeah kind of specialize like figure out where you want to work first and then get your master's in that yeah well okay so academia we are there for students yeah. we're there to help others we're help to help them, and if we don't have that experience to help them to tell them about experience, like I see these professors, and I don't consider myself an academician actually. Here I am a dean of a school. <laughs> anyway, but and if you just go straight into academia, you are so small-minded. Yes. I'm gonna tell you, I've seen so much small-mindedness. That's the only way I can say it, and and I mean it in the best use of that word, small-mindedness. I just offended everybody who's <laughs> watching this video right now. Um, so you heard a very strong opinion. Go out and um, get a job somewhere before you get out of Thank you. I guess uh, I'll, I'll just add a comment to that. So I, I agree that it really helps to go out and sort of get some experience and sort of figure out um, what the, um, for lack of a better term, real world looks like before you um, but um, for masters and PhDs in engineering, you don't really need you don't need financially a sponsor for you to go to grad school, right? So um, you'll be funded through a grant. It won't be massive amounts of money. You're not going to live a lavish lifestyle or anything. But you don't pay tuition, and you get a little bit of money for to live on. And 
health insurance and stuff like that. So um, I wouldn't do it for the money piece necessarily, but it's it's worth it to go out and get some experience um, in between. I, I think I worked in between every every one of my too many degrees. So. Yeah, I was like, Ed, one thing is, well, I mentioned I started my grad school in, in aerospace engineering and then shifted. And part of that shift was because once I was in the workplace, I realized I didn't necessarily want to be, I thought I wanted to be like a technical fellow for aerospace. Like if you would have asked me before I really started working. And once I got in there, I was like, actually, that's not really what I want to do. I want to be more of like a team leader, like program manager type person with technical know-how, but I also want to you know, manage teams and that was my shift into more systems engineering. So it just helps you focus into what you want to do and in a pretty short time, I think you can probably figure it out too. You don't have to go to industry for, you know, five or 10 years, spend a year and then figure it out. You want to figure out the fast if, if it's for you or if it's not for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Right. Because I, I mean, when, when I was like a, a consulting engineer, very, very quickly I was like, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I got a master's and then Initially, I didn't want to do like a PhD. Yeah. Uh, it's not like, you know, I had like a revelation. Yeah. But after like, just like three or four months, I mean, I love my colleagues, I and mean, don't get me wrong, that was, that was very good people. But I was kind of like sick and tired after like two months, just in like two months on the job, I was just like pressing a button, doing like validation calculations. Uh, that, was, that was a cool project. That was for like uh, looking at the uh, uh, living module for the uh, International Space Shuttle. But I was just doing like validation calculations. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm just like pressing the button, <laughs> going to the next page, pressing the button, making sure like all the numbers lined up. Yeah. I was like, okay, I, I can do that for like 15 years. Or like, I, I was like, I can't even do that for like a year. Yeah. 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 So I knew, I mean, regardless if I went back to grad school or not, I knew that I wanted to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I'll follow on one more, one more thing. So, yeah, so, so uh, one of the nice things about where I work at the Corps of Engineers is that you have options on how you do it. Mm -hmm. So if you did want to go to work right away, like I did that with your bachelor's, you can do the distance learning where you just take one semester at a time. Mm -hmm. But we also offer a program that they call long-term training where you get, you get paid your full salary, but you, you move away for a year to, to whatever college where you want to get your PhD. They pay you your salary. They would pay you per diem to live on. You take all of your classes and then you come back after that year and you work and you work and finish out your PhD. So that's also a nice program that has a lot of benefits too, just as an option. Yeah, there's definitely more than one way to go to grad school and it's yeah. worth sort of talking to a lot of people and figuring out what those are. So, I mean, we, we certainly send people on internships, so you, know, you may not have gone and got work experience before, but in the middle of your master's, you can go spend six months at a company and learn the application of what you're what you're studying and so th there's um, the, probably the biggest thing about um, grad school is that it's so much more flexible than undergrad like undergrad is very like you have to do this and then there's this little line and you have to do this and then right here you're doing all these things that are really rote and it sort of follows on to what you were saying about the process of thinking. Yeah, the, the whole the whole thing is abstract versus the, the concrete that you have in undergrad so mm -hmm. there's there's lots of lots of opportunities to shape it the way you want. And if you go talk to somebody at a university about grad school, talk to a professor, talk to anybody, um, you're, remember that you're interviewing them and they're the ones that are gonna sort of help you get where you want. If you're not comfortable with that person, right? Um, professors are kind of islands, right? So they, they, they sort of do things. We try not to be, I think, but we work in an area and we sort of work in a, in a way, right? Everybody has their way of sort of doing things. So when you're going, going to interview for grad school, go and talk to people, feel comfortable with them. You know, it's not, I wouldn't worry as much about the project itself as the relationship and what you feel like you're going to learn and how you feel like you're going to pro professionally develop during that. Maybe we should answer another question. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I think the candid talk is good. Um, anyone else have a question? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, hi, my name is Anshu Agarwal. I am a master's student at UC Berkeley, um, and I'm actually planning on going and working in industry and then maybe considering coming back for a PhD. 
Um, and I know that you guys kind of touched on a little bit the things that may have driven you to go back to grad school, whether you were maybe unhappy in your track or whatever you were doing. But I guess from more of a personal uh, standpoint, I was wondering what kind of things motivated you to really go back to school? Because like some of you said, it's not really a glamorous lifestyle. You don't really make a lot of money. Um, and a lot of times industry will maybe provide you with the skills that you need or whatever technical skills you may need for the job that you want. So I was just kind of wondering like what personally motivated you and inspired you to go back? Um, I, I went back uh, pretty quickly because I knew that if I didn't do it relatively quickly for me I would probably never do it so I wasn't really ready I was like oh I just finished undergrad the last thing I do want to do right now is go to grad school but I gave it a little bit of time and was like all right I know if I don't go back like within the first year I'm it's never gonna happen so my motivate I, well, I wasn't like honestly like super motivated to do it but then once you, once I got into grad school then I I actually liked it better than undergrad because it is much more like group projects and some of the professors actually came out of industry and were giving really good like real world examples and it was um i actually ended up really enjoying it um and then i thought maybe i would get my phd but too much time passed between when i finished grad school and going back so now i probably never will but you know maybe maybe i will when i retire or something <laughs> Let me, let me make a comment there, and it's qualifying what you said about money. I did this study. So it, we, right now, the average salary engineering is coming out 65000 after bachelor's degree. And master's, it's about 73000 And for a PhD, it, it's from 100000 to 110000 And when you integrate that over the next 30 years with the rate of growth of those things, you'll see that the, er, the, the earlier you get the degree, the more money that means in the long run. 